The next topic in this course is our FEMA models. So we've, in this acronym, our FEMA, we've seen all the letters that appear in there except for the F. The F stands for fractional. And what this refers to is that now instead of taking differences with respect to, let's say, D equal 1, D equal 2, D equal 3 even, now we're going to look at fractions of 1. We're going to look at values of D between 0 and 0 0.5. And so as you will see, is that this offers a, you could say, a compromise between doing d equals 0 versus doing d equal 1. Okay, so we've looked at ARIMA models in the past. So here's our full ARIMA model. We have a P, we have a Q, capital P, capital Q, season S. And when we didn't have to worry about differencing, our data exhibited what was often referred to as a short memory because the autocorrelations go to zero somewhat quickly as h goes to infinity. So here's our autocorrelation plot. And we have lag one, lag two, three, four. And let's say you know we have nothing dealing with our seasonal. You know, we might see something like this for the autocorrelation plot, where eventually, after not too many lags, uh, we're going to have approximately zero autocorrelation. Now, a long memory time series does not have that happen. You know, rho of h goes to zero uh, slowly. So, you know, if we had, let's say, non-stationarity in the mean, you know, we would see high values of these autocorrelations. It would take a long time for these autocorrelations to get uh, to zero. And so when we would see something like this, then what we would do is simply do some differencing of the time series. Um, however, there are cases where using the kinds of differences that we've been talking about may be too severe uh, to fix this problem and result in over differencing. And what can happen is that um, this could introduce artificial patterns in your time series and reduce forecasting accuracy. So, as kind of a compromise then between doing differencing and not doing differencing, in situations where you might have an autocorrelation plot that looks something like this. And here's 1, here's negative 1, so here's maybe about 0.5. You know, you might see some larger autocorrelations that persist over the different lags and it take a long time to get to zero but these autocorrelations aren't similar to what we've seen previously when differencing was needed where we had uh, sometimes very close to one autocorrelations so as a compromise in those situations uh, some researchers started to to develop in the late 1980s, um, what would happen, um, or they started developing ways that you could still kind of do differencing, but not d equal 1. You could do somewhere between 0 and 0 0.5. Some original examples where, um, uh, where this was applied was with respect to economics and hydrology, but there are examples now uh, with respect to computer network traffic in meteorology. Okay. So as I said, we're going to now have D be somewhere between 0 and 0 0.5. And so if we just simply look at our usual model, where we don't have any AR component, we don't have any MA component, this is what it would look like. And now with taking D between 0 and 0 0.5, we don't get this simple, let's say, XT minus XT minus 1 on the left hand side of our expression and instead what you can do is rewrite the differencing part with x of t rewrite it as as we kind of seen before as an infinite sum from j equals zero to infinity of some constants out in front pi sub j times x of j i'm sorry x of t minus j okay 
Now, in this particular case, how do we come up with this pi sub j now, since we're taking this to a, a fractional power? Well, these pi sub j's actually come about through a Taylor series expansion. So, just to review, all of you should have seen a Taylor, Taylor series expansion uh, before in another course like calculus. And just to review what one is, let's say we have some function f of b. Um, and what we like to do is uh, put together this, uh, come up with what well, often people say is an approximation uh, to f of b using a Taylor series expansion. The approximation holds if you don't take this, um, um, uh, this sum up to positive infinity. If you go up to infinity, then you get equality. And let's say that we say f with a superscript uh, j in parentheses represents the j derivative. And we evaluate this f of b, this derivative of f of b, at some value a, a numerical value. Then one can show that f of b is equal to the sum j equals 0 to infinity. This jth derivative evaluated at a divided by j factorial times b minus a raised to the jth power. When we have this a here, often uh, people refer to this as doing a Taylor series expansion where you're expanding about this numerical constant a. So let's now apply this Taylor series expansion idea to 1 minus b raised to the dth power. Okay, so to begin with here, when j is equal to 0, then we are not taking an actual derivative, so we simply get 1 minus b raised to the dth power again, but now we're expanding about 0, so we have 1 minus 0 to the dth power, or just simply 1. j is 0, so we have 0 factorial, and then we have b minus 0 raised to the 0 power, because j is 0. Then when d is equal to 1, well, we take the derivative of 1 minus b raised to the dth power, so we get a uh, d out in front. We have a negative because of the chain rule. Uh, we have 1 minus 0 raised to the d minus 1 power now. j factorial is 1 factorial. And then b minus 0 raised to the 1 power. And you can keep on going with the sum. And this is what you end up getting here. And so... What this corresponds to, and you, and you can also put a b to the 0 power in front of 1 if you wanted to. What this corresponds to is these coefficients on b represent our pi's. And one could show, and don't, don't worry about showing this, one can show that you, know, you could rewrite this so that pi sub j is equal to the gamma function uh, evaluated j minus d uh, divided by the gamma function at j plus 1 and divided by the gamma function at negative d. So this gamma function, you should have seen this in a mathematical statistics course. Here's just a review what the gamma function gives you. Uh, you might be worried though about seeing gamma of negative d, but in the end that negative part always ends up falling out and uh, so that's why people can still write it like this. So I prefer though taking a look at this recursive relationship for pi sub j, where you start with a pi sub 0 is equal to 1. So for example, if j is equal to 0, um, zero then we have pi 1 is equal to 0 minus d times pi 0 um, all over 0 plus 1, and we get negative d, which is what we had previously when we actually formally did do the Taylor series expansion. Now also one could show that the x of t itself can be rewritten in terms of infinite uh, com linear combination of the w's. Here's then the corresponding um, uh, psi coefficients on that. Okay, so in this simple model where we don't have an AR component, when we don't have an MA component, how would we actually go about estimating d? Well, the, the procedure that's typically used is that one can uh, basically get your, or formulate the model in terms of the w's, square them, add them all up, and look for the value of d that actually minimizes this sum of squared errors, essentially. 
And so in this particular situation, sorry, I, I, I didn't mention this earlier. Um, we will not be specifying D as we had done previously. We're going to actually let the data estimate D for us. And this is how we can do it by minimizing a sum of squared errors, essentially. If you're interested in knowing more about iterative numerical methods that actually do this, take a look at Shomwain Stouffer's book. Now, we can extend the idea of these kinds of models to allow an AR component and an MA component. And so this is what our model would look like. D, again, is between 0 and 0 0.5. Um, that's is the custom to with these kinds of models to look for these fractional differences. Uh, w is our white noise again. Now, notice in here, we have xt minus mu. You know, we've talked about before how one could, let's say, um, work with an ARMA model or a REMA model or an AR or MA model where you mean adjust your, uh, your data values so that now we have, you could say this is Z sub T, something that has an expected value of zero. Um, the way that these our FEMA models are often introduced, structured, is so that you always have a mean of, a mean of zero for your your thing that you're observing, and this simply can be done by mean adjusting uh, your your value there. Uh, typically, the way that mu then is estimated in these particular cases is simply the sample mean is used as the estimate. Um, this whole idea of mean adjusting like this often goes back to some original ways that time series analysis uh, was done, where this was the customary um, uh, thing to do. In fact, when I started teaching this particular course, uh, that's what I would always do, is mean adjust the data first, and then um, then go ahead and, and work with an ARIMA model. Now, another reason why I bring this up, too, is that the... Uh, package that we will be using to estimate these models and the corresponding function for it always requires you to mean adjust your data first okay um, <clears throat> excuse me now because of this 1 minus b raised to the d power is in there we could also rewrite that part as this um, uh, as you could say like a, a pi operator um, corresponding to the differences and corresponding to what we were seeing before for these coefficients uh, of, of for, for pi on the b's. Excuse me. And so, you know, one way to think of this then is that since this is an infinite expression, of course, you can't go back to infinity, so you have to chop it off at some point. You can think of, let's say, what we're doing here is putting this z sub t through what's what I've used as a term earlier in the course as a linear filter. Um, where, you know, we're just applying this linear combination or these, these coefficients and forming a linear combination and, and you could say filtering uh, this z sub t. Okay, some notes here. Um, a seasonal form of the model could also be introduced. We're not going to worry about that in this course. Um, so we've already talked about the, the mu part here. Um, again, this is just the customary way that these kinds of models are, are introduced. And especially now since we have that, uh, that pi operator there where we're working with it, um, uh, what will be an infinite um, linear combination of these um, of these uh, of our data it's just a way to more cleanly write out your model than rather than uh, approach it in a similar way to what we did before when we had that constant that we put on the MA part of the side of the model okay I've talked about that particular note as well when we actually estimate the model in this case we're going to assume that the uh, the W's are are from a normal distribution and we will be able to use just regular old diagnostic method, mesh, methods to examine um, our model as well 
uh, parameter estimation and forecasting then can proceed using similar techniques as described earlier in the course. The actual package that we will use is FractDiff. FractDiff is one of uh, maybe about three different packages that allow some kind of um, our FEMA models. Um, I will be honest that I don't think that there is any package that is necessarily completely satisfactory with their use. Um, Fract this diff is um, traditionally used, probably the most often used one uh, for this purpose. So that's why I chose to use this. And some of the people who first developed these methods are involved in the development of this package. So that's another what, reason why I use this package. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. We're once again going to first look at an example that deals with simulated data. And the reason being is because we know where we need to get to with this. And this kind of helps verify that indeed we are approaching uh, this problem the right way. Okay, so we have one AR parameter, V1. D is going to be 0.3. No MA part. The AR parameter is 0.2 and we're going to have mu be equal to zero for this particular problem in terms of when I simulate the data. So to simulate the data, one can use a frac diff.sim function to do that. And so I need to download and install my frac diff package, set a seed so I can reproduce my result, and then I'm going to put my data into an object called x.ex, for example. Frac diff, sample size of 500. My AR parameter is 0.2. If I have more than one AR parameter, I would combine them together into a, um, into a uh, vector form using the C function. Since I do not have any MA component, I'm going to put a null there. For D, I put in 0.3. Uh, my Ws are going to have a normal distribution. Standard deviation of 1, mean of 0. Now, what's returned to the user in x.exe is actually a list rather than a vector of these numerical values, where if I pull out the series component of the list, there's where my data is. Okay, now in this particular example now, uh, for, for the rest of it, Rather than simulating it directly uh, from um, or using this particular simulated data, I've actually already simulated some data in the past. Uh, I have it in a ASCII, plain ASCII text file, x underscore rfema.txt. And that's what I'm going to use then for the remainder of this, uh, this example. So I'm going to use the read.table function to read in the data. The data is in that particular file. Uh, if you actually look at the file, you'll notice that um, the variable x is the first uh, is in the first row, so header equal true, and everything's space delimited. And this is what it looks like here when I read it in. I'm going to pull x out of this data frame that I read in and just simply call it x. And that's what we're going to work with for this problem. So let's take a look at a plot using normal methods of the data. And this is what we get. Um, you know, I don't think there's necessarily anything unusual. We do see some kind of maybe oscillating pattern here through the plot. Let's look at an ACF and a PACF of the, of the data. Okay. So here's the ACF. And remember at the beginning here, I said that we have a long memory uh, data. And these autocorrelations are not necessarily all extremely large as we would normally see if D was actually equal to 1. And indeed, this is what we have with this particular data. Notice it takes me to get out to about, to about lag 17 before I have a non-significant value. But I'm also not seeing, you know, extremely large autocorrelations as well. And if you could keep on going along here, and even though that these are non-significant, but they're all positive, 
almost all of them are positive, um, saying again that we have this long memory. Now I have to admit of, of a simulated time series where there's a fractional difference needed, this is probably one of the shortest memories of all of these uh, simulated data sets that I've actually seen. Typically I do see a lot longer periods of time where you have, let's say, significant uh, autocorrelations. And so just on your own, you can actually examine that. Um, you know, actually use my program that simulated the data and run it a few times without setting a seed. And what you're going to see is eventually you're going to get to see if you can see here how we have a lot longer number of lags where we have a significant autocorrelation. Let's just do a few more here to see if we come up with any that are even a lot longer. It's not too bad. Uh, that one, that one's not too bad either. Uh, but I'm, I've seen them even longer, out to 30 or 40, where you have these significant autocorrelations in these particular settings. So try this on your own and, and see what happens. So the key thing is that the ACF of the simulated data is tailing off very slowly, although the autocorrelations are not very large. This is typical of what we see with a situation where we need an RFEMA model. So let's uh, go ahead and try to estimate the model. Now this frac diff function, as I mentioned before, requires that the data to be um, mean adjusted. Obviously, with this simulated data, as I mentioned, uh, we have uh, mu is equal to zero, but the observed sample mean is not going to be zero, so we do need to still mean adjust. So simply I take x minus the mean of x, and now I'm going to be working with x dot adj, adj standing for adjusted. So to you simply estimate the model, frac dot diff, x dot adj, and let's estimate that one AR parameter that we know should be there. I'm going to put the results into an object called mod.fit for the lack of a better name again. And this is what we get. So I just simply type mod.fit. Here is my d hat. Here is my phi hat one. Now remember that d was 0.3, phi one was 0.2. So we're getting values at essentially that we would expect in this simulated setting. Sigma hat w, notice I do not put a square on that, is 0.9928. In the output also, uh, this is the only function I've ever seen that this done, where in the output it shows you then what are the components of the list that's returned from frac.diff. Uh, but like many other R functions, uh, like the LM function, the GLM function, if you're familiar with that, there is a summary method function available to you so that if you use the summary generic function, you get a summary of the stuff that's inside the return list. So this is what we have here. We've already seen these estimates. Here is the square root. Of the estimated variance of d hat, in other words, the standard error. What we see done here is forming a, a z test statistic. So z is equal to d hat divided by that square root of the estimated variance. We get then using a standard normal approximation, a p value corresponding is d equal to zero or not. And we see that there's sufficient evidence to indicate that d does not equal zero. A similar thing is also done for the AR parameter too. And again, we see that there's sufficient evidence to indicate that phi one does not equal zero. Okay. Now, with um, the results for mod.fit, we have many other generic functions that are available to us. Uh, we can use vcove to find the estimated covariance matrix as well. We can look inside of mod.fit and although I guess uh, just from using uh, simply printing mod.fit, we got this, this information. Here's the information again from using names and mod.fit. Okay, so what does then the estimated model look like when we write it out? And again, whenever you're estimating a model, I would expect you to actually write it out. 
this is what we get for the corresponding model here. Now, notice how I incorporate that mean or the estimated mean into this here. You know, again, we're taking xt minus mu. That's the, uh, the true model. What we found is that the estimate of mu, let's call it mu hat, was negative 0.1712. Or you could call it x bar if you wanted to. So when I put that in there, notice I have a negative there. I have a negative there. That's why I have a positive there. Some other notes. Um, so here is then again uh, that test statistic for the phi 1 parameter. Um, this is uh, just something that I found interesting uh, when I was first uh, looking through these RFEMA models. Uh, so one of the original papers is uh, by Haslett and Rafferty. Um, and uh, they discuss um, using what's called a VAX computer to do the calculations. Um, I expect that probably most of you who are watching this video do not know what a VAX computer is, but I will tell you I used to actually use one. A VAX computer was a mainframe computer where essentially you use what's called a dummy terminal. Imagine uh, you know using your laptop, but the laptop has uh, basically no essentially no memory in it and all it is is just uh, a monitor and a keyboard and you'd be hooked up to this mainframe multiple people could be using the mainframe at the same time it's very much like the situation nowadays where you're using let's say supercomputers um, as well but you don't have you're not doing any um, you don't have a, a let's say a smart computer you're using a, what's called a dummy terminal and so anyway uh, so with a vax computer uh, they say that a single evaluation of the Likert function takes three hours. And to find an MLE would take 45 hours to complete. That's just amazing. But in the Haslett and Raftery paper, they actually use an algorithm uh, that um, actually uses what's called a truncated Likert function, where they omit the first M initial observations, where with these m initial observations, they try to come up with some um, um, some initial estimates of some of some things, uh, so that it makes the uh, the estimation process for the remaining observations uh, much easier. And they say a single evaluation of a of, of the Likert function took 2.5 minutes. Still a lot in comparison to uh, when you run my corresponding code. How long it takes it takes very little time uh, I guess another little side note here uh, these VAX computers probably uh, stopped being used in about the uh, late 1990s I last used a VAX computer in 1996 when I was on an internship at a pharmaceutical company okay so how would you do some forecasting so we have 500 observations here and uh, <clears throat> we want to f forecast, let's say, that first observation after the 500. Well, one would can approach this in a somewhat similar manner to what we did before. First of all, we're going to let z sub t be x of t minus mu. Excuse me. Here's our AR part of the model. Here's the differencing part of the model. Here's wt. Okay, so let's now multiply some stuff out. So I take ZT with that differencing part times 1. This is what I get. I do the same thing for the 0.1875 times B part right there. Notice how I have a ZT minus 1 now because of that B right there. Then let's just find Z sub T itself on the left side. How do we do that? Well, at j equals 0, remember what happens. We have pi 0 times b raised to the 0 power. So b raised to the 0 power is 1. We know also pi 0 is equal to 1 itself. So how about we just take that first term out of that sum. And so now the sum will start from j equal 1 to infinity. And we bring that stuff over to the right side of my expression. I also am going to bring this part over to the right side of my expression. So now I have 
a way to represent my model, so I only have z sub t on the left side. I could do a little bit of more uh, algebra here. Again, notice how I start at j equals 0 for this particular sum. How about we just work with uh, j equal 1 to infinity and actually distribute through that uh, that j equals 0 part there, that would be multiplied by z sub t minus 1. What do I get? Well, 0.1875 times z sub t minus 1, because again, pi 0 is 1. b raised to the 0 power is 1 as well. Okay, so there's our model. And so if I were to find then the expected value of z sub 501, given my past information available to me, look what happens. T is 501, so I have a W there. Um, and eventually, when I distribute the expectation through this um, through these terms here, of course, expected value of W sub 501, given my pass up to time point 500, that expected value is zero. So that part's going to disappear. Then I could also start writing everything out in terms of this linear combination of the pies with that stuff that's in parentheses right there. And notice I'm going to have an infinite sum essentially. So obviously though you can't go back past, uh, let's say z equal, uh, you can't go down to z zero, z negative one and so on. So eventually though you will chop, have to chop this off. But that's how you would find then the corresponding forecasted value. And you can see you know, it, it's a lot more difficult than maybe what we've seen with some previous ARIMA models because now we are going to have essentially 500 terms here uh, to work with. Now, also remember this Z is the mean adjusted version of X. And so Z T is equal to X T minus mu. I would like to be able to rewrite, though, all this in terms of 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 x of t itself so that means whatever i get for my forecasted value for z sub t i'm going to now need to add mu to it because look what happens when i bring mu over to the uh, left side of this equation that i just written out now unfortunately fractif does not have a function available to find forecasts um, and in fact, when I've taught this bef uh, in the, uh, a few times when I've taught this course in the, in the past, I actually had went through the process of finding this long linear combination of the pi's with the z's here, wrote a for loop to do it, and that's how I would have to find all the forecasts. But with this latest implementation of my course notes, uh, Fortunately, I found another package that will automatically do the forecast for us. This package is called Forecast. Now, in time series analysis with respect to R, there are a few different packages out there that are meant to be, let's say, all purposes packages for time series analysis. Uh, they essentially do all the stuff that you would have already in the stats package, but Based upon what the author thinks, they think that their package does some stuff, you could say, better. And also they try to, um, um, you know, put stuff in a more um, uh, similar form for all the different kind of modeling procedures. You know, as I probably mentioned before, my feeling in terms of using R is that always use the functions first that are in the default um, uh, R installation uh, because there's tighter controls over what those packages uh, will be able to do and what they will do in the future. There will not necessarily be, let's say, some package author on a whim decides to change one argument from, uh, let's say, instead of being formula to model. Uh, you won't run into that if you always stick with the stuff that's in the default installation of R. Also, the stuff that's in the default installation of R has been tested a lot more. It has been used a lot more by authors, so I typically trust that stuff more than I will a user-contributed package. 
However, there are times where there's just not something that you need. Uh, there's something. There are times when there's something that you need that's not in the default installation of R, and so that's why we use them. Uh, the frac diff package to do this. Um, and now we're going to use. Uh, we're going to take advantage of one of these all-purpose time series packages out there called Forecast, since it allows us to do forecasting with these fractional uh, difference models. Okay, enough about that. So to do the forecasting, I can use a function from Forecast called Forecast. Now you know where the <laughs> the name of the function comes, uh, name of the package comes from. Um, and uh, so I say object equal. Here's where I save my results from estimating the model. I want two time periods of head uh, for my forecast, so that's what H corresponds to. And I want 95% intervals actually produced, and that's what the level argument uh, says. I'm going to put the results into an object called save.4, and this is what I get. So this right here, x tilde 501 with a superscript 500. That's that first forecasted value. And we have nicely uh, the corresponding um, uh, confidence intervals. Now note, I didn't make a little bit of a mistake here. That actually should be z, not x. So z, 501, 500 tilde. It's 95% confidence interval is 1.43 as the upper bound and negative 0.47 as the lower bound. Now, to put this back on the X scale, all you need to do is add whatever you had for mu hat to the uh, lower and upper bound, and then you'll get it for X. Okay. So if we look inside of save.4, we see that we have a list. And if we pull out the mean component, this is where the forecasts are. And notice what I did here. I mean adjusted, or I adjusted back these forecasts to be on the X scale as well. And also with inside this list, you're going to see an upper component, a lower component corresponding to that 95% confidence interval. And notice how I just simply mean adjust back to put it on the original X scale. This package also provides, uh, I guess you could say, some crude uh, um, graphs corresponding to the uh, time series and also the corresponding forecasts. You're welcome to take a closer look at this on your own, but this is what happens when I use the generic plot function with the uh, information that's saved uh, from doing the forecasting. Okay, so that concludes uh, uh, this first part of working with uh, our, our FEMA models.